with Ring Nikai and T would probably be a million, uh, one to a million, uh, or whatever you do it, a plus minus uh, a million for uh, Tia. I mean, Ring Nikai just looked. It, 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 I, I, she basically got like, you know, uh, even though Su Yawan didn't get the fight, Ring Nikai looked like she didn't break a sweat against uh, Tia. Well, I got to speak to Ren Nakai after the event because I was part of the media. And then we also got to like see the post-fight press conferences. And so she and Usami, I don't know if you guys know this or not, Ren Nakai is kind of like notoriously a slow starter in fights. Oh, yeah. And so Usami was like, it's actually a good thing. We kind of had this, what they would call low-level opponent in the opening fight because it gave her a chance to kind of warm up and get in the groove of things before the big fight with Sugiyama later in the day. I mean, I think they essentially called it like a really good workout session. <laughs> so what do you think of the what do you think of the first fight, Anuk? Well the first fight, yeah, I mean I I like you guys from the start, I kind of expected Nakai to win. Um yeah, that's I mean it wasn't really a fight in the sense that she was ever on the verge of losing or anything. It was just being that guy from the start. She just dominated. So, yeah. I mean, I know that um, TA, she... I mean, I remember, like, when the fights were, like, the matchups were announced, she was, like, asked for comments. And she was like, well, I know this is going to be a tough fight, but I'm going to do my best. So, kind of, I kind of felt that she herself also kind of thought the chances of her winning against Nakai being low, which, yeah, of course, realistically speaking. Yeah, yeah and that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> she really had nothing to lose, I feel like, going into the fight, because in Deep Jewels, they don't really care about your record, because in, in Japan in general, and if she wins, she beats one of the best flyweights in Japanese history. If she loses, nobody really remembers, because it was the, one of the best flyweights in Japanese history, so yeah. Credit yeah. to her for taking the fight, but yeah, that was Rinda Kai. I mean, well, she was like half a second away from getting her to tap. I think she, I think Tia did tap, but the bell had already rung to end the first round. So yeah, that was like, I wasn't sure. Like, because I was like, did she? Because I think, I think the referee stopped it actually. Oh, really? But I'm not, because like it was really weird timing, wasn't it? Like with the end yeah, of the that, round. Yeah. And then I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got the impression the ref was like kind of diving in because the bell rang, but I couldn't tell either. So it wasn't the same thing that Sugiyama fight. I didn't see Sugiyama yeah. tap, but the referee still got no. stopped. That's no, uh, Tia definitely tapped in the first round, but like the round was over. I think that's what Anuk and I are talking about. Oh. It was kind of like that. What is that? That Celine Haga, Amy Montenegro fight in Invicta where. Celine Haga tapped after the bell and they went back and, and slept Amy, but the bell rang and then the ref didn't stop it. So it was like the weirdest fight of all time. But it happens in MMA, I guess. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I was, I'm, I'm getting confused with the Sugiyama fight as well because like both of them were kind of like, there were a few instances in the fights where I was like, did this person tap or not? But like, I think yeah. like you're actually right. Like she did tap, but I mean, yeah. The ref well, Tia definitely tapped in the first round when the round was over. I don't know if she tapped in the second round, the official stoppage for the fight. But I think a lot of times in deep jewels, when there's like a younger, less experienced fighter, the referee will do a technical stoppage for the submission. Because A, I don't think Japan wants to pay medical bills. I don't think deep jewels wants to pay medical bills for a shattered arm. And I don't think the crowd wants to see that either. A Deep Jewels crowd, like 10 years ago, a Deep Jewels crowd was primarily men. But now it's probably 50, 50 men and women. Also, a lot of kids in the crowd. Like a lot of families go to the events. So I don't think they want to see like a bone popping out of someone's arm and somewhere. So yeah, refs are more prone to jump in, I think. No, I totally now uh, remember what happened because yeah, you're right. She tapped in the first round, but like the bell was already like after the bell and then she was like yeah <laughs> like yeah i can go on to the second round she looked really happy that they yeah. went to second round and the second round the referee stopped it i don't think she tapped there but like there was basically no way out for her 
I feel like Tia's had a tough run of it. It's like the problem with a lot of the women's divisions is it's like, oh, the the top like five fighters are like world class. And then the bottom five fighters in the division are kind of like not nearly that level. And so Tia makes her debut. She fights some opponents her level. And then they're like, oh, do you want to fight King Reyna? Who say what you will about King Reyna? King Reyna is a skilled fighter with a lot of experience. Uh. And then King Reyna beat the shit out of her. And then it's like, oh, that's a tough loss. How about Ren Nakai in your next fight? <laughs> it's like, oh, just a worse to worse. Like Tia's had a tough run of it recently. Wait, she didn't have any fight. Like, because her both of her fights, like the fight before her cancel, right? Oh, so- that's what I wanted to talk about actually at first was this tournament. Rin Nakai winning it, unfortunately, is the only way this tournament seems legitimate because she's the only person that had to fight someone every round <laughs> to make it to the finals of the tournament. But um, yeah, like, because she was, Tia was supposed to fight. Who was she supposed to? She was supposed to fight. Um, was it um, the smoker Jim Girl, I think? No, 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 no. That, that, so Sugiyama was supposed to fight Aoi Kuriyama at this event, but Aoi Kuriyama missed weight. And oh, at the yeah. fight <laughs> before, I believe Hanako Sawa was supposed to fight the other girl from Osaka. No, Hanako Sawa was supposed to fight Aoi Kuriyama, and Hanako yeah. Sawa got injured and pulled out. So that's why Aoi Kuriyama advanced without fighting. And then <laughs> the other girl who had fought Hanako Sawa before, whose name is escaping me, I think she was supposed to fight Tia and she had Corona or missed weight. She, she had COVID. So she was out of it. And my whole issue was they should have done a reserve fight because after the first round of the tournament, there's like a, literally an event in Osaka a week later where the COVID girl probably could have fought Aoi Kuriyama or something. But you know what's weird? Have you noticed that Ryzen as well as uh, I guess Deep Jewels, they aren't. There's not doing reserve fights for the tournament recently. I don't think they have the people. I don't think a lot of these divisions, like especially flyweight division in Japan, is so like every flyweight in Japan was in this tournament. I don't think there really were alternates to be found. You couldn't just have like two of the losers or the two of the people who uh, didn't advance initially just be as, you know, a backup. That's why I've always thought you should always do in terms of reserve yeah. bouts, have two people who lost just, you know, face each other. You know? well, that's what I would have done, but yeah. The thing is, I think pull, pulling out of fights, I think, is rare in Japan. And so maybe they think they can squeak by, but in the era of COVID, you need to have some preparations made for backup fights, at least, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the flyweight tournament, I mean, the atomweight tournament had some holes in it, but it kind of scraped along. But the flyweight tournament was hit really hard because half of the, I feel like half the fighters pulled out. So uh, at least the uh, microwave tournament, is that what they still call it? Microweight? It was Adam Weight. It was Adam Weight. Oh, no, I was saying, didn't uh, Deep Jewels have a microwave tournament last year? Oh, well, that, ago? that fell apart even worse. That, um, that was even worse bullshit. That was um, essentially, if I remember correctly, Mizuki Furuse was supposed to fight Amp the Rocket and got pregnant. So they just made Amp the Rocket the champion. And then Mizuki <laughs> Furuse, Furuse has fought more recently than Amp the Rocket, who is now back in Thailand. And according to Asayaki, I think she's working a non-martial arts job. So I don't even know if she's coming back. So that, that tournament fell apart even worse than this. Yeah, you're right. Oh, um, interesting. But um, no, can't but... seem to get a break. They can't seem to get a break. Another good thing about this tournament, though, was that, I mean, I, I was absolutely, it was at the Korakuen Hall, and this event, it did have a good, um, had a lot of attention. I feel like there was op, like a really good feeling from the crowd going into the event. There's a lot of people. There's like more people than at a normal event. I think there's a little over a thousand fans there, which is, is pretty Cor- big. Is Korakuen running full capacity at this point? It is running full capacity. And when I looked around, it was completely, f- you know, how this, the, um, there's the one side where the bleachers go all the way to the top. So that was filled except for like the last quarter of it. And everything else was completely filled. 
Still no so, cheering though, right? No cheering uh, is allowed, right? No, there's cheering. I'm telling you, it's not as nearly as bad. The restrictions have gone down a lot because back to like, I remember when I was at deep a hundred or yeah, deep a hundred where they had to post a security guard by a drunk fan to get them to stop cheering. But um, no, cheering's back on. People are cheering. It seems like a normal event. It seems like it's not the Corona era anymore. All that there really is is they make you write your address on the back of your ticket when they come in. So in case there's a like a spreader event, they can contact everyone that was there and let them know to go get tested. That's pretty much all that's going on now. So who? So in, uh, under your impression, uh, CJ, who do you think was the most, uh, or who did who did it appear was the most over? Mm-hmm. Most popular, or who had the who got the most fans uh, at the uh, show? Well, it's hard to tell because there's like different types of fans, and each fighter kind of generates their own types of fans. So, according Saiki's comments, were he thinks that the combination of Ren Nakai and Sugiyama moved a bulk of the tickets, mm. and that they're both very popular fighters. They've been around for a long time, and they've generated their own fan bases. Uh, my wife went to the event. She doesn't really go to that many Deep Jewels events, but my wife loves Sugiyama. So my wife bought a ticket from Sugiyama because all the fighters sell their own tickets. And so they all sit together. So the sections are pretty big of individual fighters, kind of like fan sections. But he said it was Ren Nakai and Sugiyama. Now from the crowd who got the biggest reaction, Oshima gets a big reaction. She has a lot of fans. And um, I'm going to tell you what. So when King Rena fought Yoko Higashi, they both had very big fan sections. I mean, I was surprised. Yoko Higashi, they had a big poster they were holding. And she had a bunch of people there. But my wife was joking that her fans were a lot more polite than King Rena's fans. King Rena's <laughs> fans are like tough, like kind of like thug kind of people. And then like Yoko Higashi's people are kind of like politely sitting there and cheering when they're supposed to and everything but yeah mm-hmm. so but i i think oshima is pretty popular i would put her up near the top as well mm-hmm. but um, yeah lotus as well right she's popular isn't she kate lotus is she's popular but i don't think she's been around around long enough to have like generated the big fan base oh, okay. plus i mean saudi oshima has that rising little push that she has Plus, I think Saudi Oshima gets a lot of female fans because they like the fact that she's a mother who's working hard to like balance all these different things that she's doing. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, what Anouk said there does bring up a good point, though. This card was like, it wasn't a very bit long card, but almost every fighter on it had a fan base. There wasn't like a sleeper fighter. Most of them had some sort of fan base on the card. But all right, so let's go after this fight. I believe we have the little ones. <laughs> we have a uh, Momoko Yamazaki versus Kyoka Chibisai. And uh, maybe Anouk, can you tell us what Chibisai means? Chibisai, I think I was still, I'm not sure. Like Chibi means like tiny, you know, like Chibisai. Mm-hmm. And you know, like there's this rising fighter called like Shibisai. Like, yes. Mm-hmm. Shibisai. So I thought like her name might be a parody on his name, but then someone told me like, no, both of their names are based on like this one character of some anime, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, but um, Was it Dragon Ball? I know it was based off of some famous anime. I'm not a big anime guy, but yeah, so that is not her real name. I was, but uh, yeah, it's just a play on the fact that she's small. So I Deep have Jules- a question about yeah. about her name and it's it's been bothering me you know one thing i've I, i've always said is that i can't stand what some of these fighters do with their names why does why does chibi side why does she spell spell the last name and katakana i think that's katakana right is that katakana? <laughs> no it's not it's oh, uh, it's it's hiragana and then oh, okay. romaji yeah yeah she goes hiragana and romaji what's why 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 is she doing this to my brain See, my thing is, I think she hasn't decided what she wants to do with her nickname. Oh, I, I think she should just, I think she should just go by Kilka. Yes. That's what she's doing. Please. But I think they like the idea because their whole marketing angle behind her is that she's really small. She's the smallest fighter in deep history. Oh, really? I think, I think she's like 4'10 mm. or 4'9. 
Like this is the only fight where Momoka has been the taller opponent in her entire career. Mm. But um, yeah, they're they're both absolutely tiny, but Kyoka is the smallest fighter in deep history. So that's why their whole marketing thing behind her is. And I think Momoka sure. got famous because she used to kind of be like a Yankee and like a tough kind of street girl. And I think she got in a fight with a guy at a convenience store and it was in all the newspapers because the guy like broke her face, like a broke her orbital bone or something in her face. But she was able to like keep the guy restrained until the police came. So she's got her tough little image too. They were saying something she all- that she's been injured for like, she's been out of it for like one and a half years because she got in a fight in a convenience store. That was what they were saying. I think, so. I think the guy hit her in the face with a bottle. Like I think it was like a bad fight. <laughs> So, yeah. Actually, they were also mentioning that like both fighters in this fight were injured and were out of it. So I, I guess Kyoka also had some sort of injury, which I'm not aware of. I've spoken to Kyoka before. So she's from Niigata Prefecture and she has no martial arts background. I think her uncle runs oh. a martial arts gym. <laughs> well, yeah. me, I, I would never guess that from watching her fights, uh, CJ, that she had no martial arts background. I will say, though, they, they this, is a, this was a good matchup because... Neither one of them have MMA backgrounds or any martial arts background, but they both just kind of brawled it out for two rounds and they were actually like bleeding a little bit. And I think the crowd got pretty into it. I got to ask about, of- about Kyoko. So mm-hmm. she's Owen three. I know you said this before that that record yeah. don't count or, or not focus on that much in deep pools. She's Owen three. Um, when does, who do you think she can be? if anybody at this point or some, or how can she get to one and three? Um, I'll, I know that I think deep likes her because she works at deep events and deep usually has fighters. They like working at deep events. Like they work the merchandise booth or they work like the ticket table. It's very much a family affair over there. And so that means that they drive her in from Niigata, which is like a three-hour train ride, to come in and then work there. So they must like her a little bit. And I think she's generating a little bit of a fan base because she's seen as attractive by people. So they market her good looks as well. As to who she can beat, um, I think she can beat. I mean, Microweight's a weird division. Microweight has some of the best fighters in Deep Jewels. And also has some of like the not best fighters in Deep Jewels. So I think they could find someone for her to beat. Like um, the person who's completely hit or miss is Mizuki Furuse. Like Mizuki Furuse seems to win fights she should lose and lose fights she should win. So that might be a fun fight. But the the two best, I mean, what the, the two best microweights are Saudi Oshima and Aya Murakami. And Aya Murakami, I think, already fought Kyoko Chibisa and submitted her, no surprise. So you just got to put her against some of these other girls that don't have a martial arts background. That's what I would do. Because when, the, when, the, the, when does the, uh, I guess, the attraction, the, uh, the and by, I don't mean attraction of like her physically, but when does the attraction lose its luster after so many losses, I guess you could say? I don't know, because Celine Haga lost a ton of fights in deep jewels and who's the other girl there was another girl who they used to have around forever from smack girls days who i think's record was like one in 20 or something it was absolutely nuts so if they like you they'll keep bringing you back because but i feel like now deep jewels is kind of up their game a little bit and they have a higher quality fighters which is probably due to mma getting more popular in japan again hmm. But she's still, I put her almost like in the same category as Kate Lotus, where they're going to give her time to get better and uh, give her all the chances she needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think of the fight, though, in general, Andrew? Uh, I mean, you know, it wasn't a, this wasn't a Max Holloway and Brian Ortega, uh, but (laughs) um, it was, you know, I mean, microweight is an interesting division. Um, apart from the fact that, like, I don't think any other major promotion does that division, at least as far as I know. Right. Um, it's you know, in terms of this fight, I mean, it what I did. I'm kind of surprised it did kind of turn to a brawl, like you said. Right. Um, 
But I, wa- I wonder if that's an account of their skills uh, or, or I guess their lack of, uh, uh, of training or experience. So they kind of just went, you know, phone booth fighting, I guess you could say. Um, I mean, listen, it is, it, this, I won't say this fight was, a te- it was, it was an ugly masterpiece. It was an ugly, it was an ugly, it was an ugly, interesting fight. That's what, and that's what kind of like was interesting about it. Where, because you, if you look at all the other fights in this card, they were, you know, you could definitely tell the experience, like it, the experience of those fighters in those respective fights. But with these two, it was kind of like it, the, the lack of, I think the lack of, the, the combined lack of experience kind of made up for what made it entertaining. Yeah. Um, I would rank, I would, I would tell people, this fight is probably as good a fight as you could expect from two people of their skill level. Yeah. Like entertainment wise, it was an exciting fight. Neither one of them are incredibly technical fighters. So this is probably the best they can I'll, offer. I'll I'll you, I, if, if somebody, if somebody was like, Hey, Andrew, I want to look for some good Joshi, uh, <laughs> Joshi um, MMA fights. I certainly would not tell them to watch uh, Momoko versus Kyoka. I would absolutely tell, <laughs> I would try, I would steer them towards other fights on this card. But uh, for the, I, this, you know, it, you sound, it sounds like the audience you said liked it mm-hmm. or there, they're like, they kind of almost like that they weren't getting into or they weren't, they weren't expecting it to be as, uh, as entertaining as it initially was. Is that what? No, I think it was just like a, on a card like this. It's just, I think the crowd appreciates the different types of fights. And every Actually, fight can't be a brawl, so you throw one yeah. brawl in there, and it kind of scratches that itch. If you don't mind me asking as well, so since this was the only um, um, microwave fight on this card, I think, I think, oh, has it been a while since they put on a micro fight? Uh, Deep Jewels, do they do any other micros this year? They have. Um, Aya Murakami, I believe, has fought this year at microwave. When okay. she beat Mizuki Furuse, I believe that was this year. If not, it was near the end of last year. The most active. Oh, was it? Yeah, probably. So Ayamu you- Murakami has been the active microweight. Mizuki Furuse has been a microweight, and I believe, um, yeah, that's probably the most recent. So, do you think the D Jules is planning to do uh, a little something with uh, with microweight potentially? This year, since uh, I think they are because I think they want to, but maybe not a tournament. But I know that Saudi Oshima said that she wants to fight Amp the Rocket next to unify the deep and the deep jewels titles. And I think since her fight with Hime, Saudi Oshima is now much more into fighting at microweight because she's tired of being oversized. Well, so. and she even fights supposedly. I mean, I just, she- we can talk about that later. Yeah, that is true yeah. as well. And um, but Mike, but the problem, the thing with microweight is Satoko Shinashi is not retired. Satoko Shinashi said she is going to come back, and Deep loves her, and so that's why they restarted this division. So if she comes back, you'll see a lot more interest in it and a lot more development. Well, here's the other thing as well. Uh, since they're the only ones that. Since Deep Jewels is the only, uh, well, as far as I know, Japanese promotion, certainly, you know, not, you know, I, I you know, well, I mean, here's the thing about, about microwave is that it's kind of Deep Jewels', Deep Jewels own division, but since I don't see any other promotions, you know, doing their own thing, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like Adam Waits, you know, there's, you know, with, you know, it's, there's no major promotion in the United States that has Adam Waits. Uh, so yeah, but are you trying to say like what's the future of the division? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, considering that, like, it does, yeah, it's the so the the uh, the career in it's probably very limited compared to if uh, you know Kuriyama wanted to stay at uh, you know flyweight, you know, or something like that. That's true, but I've always felt that a lot of the deep jewels fighters don't really see themselves as professional fighters. They, they see MMA as more of like the hobby that they're into. They all have other jobs that they're doing, except for like very few, very popular fighters that can live off of their sponsorships. And if a fighter gets popular at uh, microweight and gets a fan base, 
you better believe that rising would be interested. They don't care about weight classes. They care about who gets eyes. I and mean, that's why they brought Panchan Rina over. Um, Kanako Murata fought at straw weight in rising. So if there's a popular fighter, they'll bring them up to rising. They don't care about weight classes. Mm-hmm. I would be hilarious though to see us uh, uh, like a microwave fight in the mm-hmm. giant rising ring and perhaps the fighters won't even uh, won't even be as tall as the ropes like um, <laughs> Momoko. Momoko, I think I think that the the, uh, the turnbuckle pad was like even taller than her. Yeah. But. I just I just want to say something because I have like a very different opinion from you guys. Actually, mm-hmm. when I watched this fight, my impression was like, well, I think especially Kyoka in my opinion, I really thought like I could see her skill pretty well. Mm-hmm. Like there were some instances when she was like on the bottom and like she kind of managed to get up. And like I really felt like, okay, maybe like hearing you guys talk, maybe it was just like instinct, like a brawl. But when I first watched it, my first impression was like, well, she must have, you know, practiced because like things just came out so fluently. So I actually was, well, I don't know. I mean, it was not like maybe like a top, top fight. But for me, I was pretty impressed because I'm like, oh, these guys definitely mm-hmm. did their practice, you know. But I don't know. Well, I, think- I thought it was interesting how you guys had like very different opinion on that. Well, I think we're also just comparing it to like the level of other fighters on the card. Yeah. Okay. Because like. <laughs> I mean, it's not an insult. Kyoka has just started her career. She's very new into the martial arts. And she's deaf. I think she has an athletic background. And you can see that she moves well. And she does seem to be improving between her fights. But the champion of the division is Saudi Oshima, who's been doing judo since she was three years old. So I think she's got a lot to catch up with. <laughs> but I, yeah, I agree. No, you're right. We were being a little too harsh on it. But I think we were just comparing it to like Ren Nakai and Sugiyama. <laughs> Speaking of which, we can move on to another. I compared Kyoka to kind of Kate Lotus in the way mm-hmm. that they're marketed. And uh, Anouk, let's start with you on this one. Andrew and I will talk everyone's ears off if we don't start with somebody else. So, what do you think of Mika Nagano making her uh, return after two years and defeating Kate Lotus? Oh, yeah. I don't. I, I think the first fight I saw of her was, I think it was the grappling tag match, was it? Oh, really? So the one with, you're talking about the grappling tag match with Seika, Izawa, yeah, Hikaru, Aono. Amy, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was, I think, the first fight I saw of her, but she has been coming out of like a long break as well, as far as I'm informed. But um, yeah, I mean, striking, like the first round, things look pretty grim for her I'd say because Kate Lowe's was just you know she's she's a good striker and she kind of dominated her in the first round but then the second round like I was really surprised when that tap came because I'm like okay well I see I I mean she obviously got her neck but then I'm like whoa that was totally unexpected but I guess I don't know because I think I in my eyes Kate Lotus was not doing anything wrong necessarily but I guess this is maybe just a matter of like the experience of like Nagano where she just saw the opportunity and just managed to place that choke perfectly and get it it was um yeah so I will provide some background information since Anuk like many of our viewers may be younger than Andrew and I and may not remember the days of Mika Nagano this fight was kind of funny because Mika Nagano was what they're trying to make Kate Lotus into Mika Nagano was like the pretty face that Deep Jewels used for a lot of their marketing. And they put on a lot of posters and everything. And Mika Nagano was a very high level wrestler. I, she, went, she was a collegiate wrestler who I think finished third in the country in the national wrestling tournament. In a tournament that included in her weight division was um, Saudi Yoshida. Is that the really famous wrestler that's on TV all the time? And who's the really... Um, so familiar with the wrestling. So no, it's like, I forget the guy, I forget her name. It's escaping me. I'm having a moment. But the woman was a three time Olympic gold medalist who was in the same weight division as her. So her finishing third was pretty impressive. And then when she fought in Deep Jewels, she, her only way she ever won was by taking somebody down and arm barring them. And she did it all the time. This is only her second finish that wasn't an arm bar finish. Mm. So, I say all of this to say I thought it was really weird that Kate Lotus elected to grapple with Mika Nagano. Mm-hmm. Mika Nagano, whose only strength is her grappling and has historically been a poor striker, 
I believe Mikanagano fought once in Rising against Miyu Yamamoto, who absolutely destroyed her because she's obviously a different caliber of wrestler. But that's why, I th- Andrew, what did you think about Kate Lotus deciding to grapple the grappler? Uh, well, you know that you know, you know that meme from Dodgeball when uh, 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 what's his name says, uh, well, let's let's see how this goes, Eric Cotton or whatever. Whatever. That's my that favorite movie. line of that movie. It's bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see bold how it plays out. Cotton. Let's see how it plays out. Well, uh, we saw how it played out, and uh, yes, it did not. Uh, the the, the uh, strategy did not pan out well for uh, Miss Lotus, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind um, of because Kate Lotus. I mean, I got think she's clearly the better striker of the two of them. Has um, Nagano has never really ever been a striker. As, Never. As, as far as I can tell in her, like, you, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, uh, well, when I was on a teep, teep podcast talking about how a fighter like Paul Daly has just never, ever done anything besides uh, striking. Nag- Nagano is like, never has done anything beyond the grappling realm. I don't even, I don't even know if she even takes like striking uh, classes uh, no. anymore. Recently, um, she's trying to make a YouTube channel where I think, most of what she does is just like personal training to stay in shape. I don't even know how much mixed martial arts training she does. Actually, so I have a so this was her return or her return in the May fight after I think you said two years was it? Mm-hmm. Did what was the impetus? Did she give a reason why she returned? Did the Sayaki give her give a reason? So I have. Did she ever officially retired? As far as I, I have. Remember. So there's no official reason. Ideas that I have had is now her child is old enough that she's able to do this and kind of go out and train. My other theory is that she's pretty close with the people in charge of Deep and Deep Jewels. And she was once a big name in women's MMA in Japan. And so they kind of bring her out every year, a couple of years to fight a new up and comer to help push over the up and comer if the up and comer can win. Mm -hmm. Because they had her come back and fight Miki Motono. And that Miki Matono won. So Miki Matono beat Mika Nagano. That's big for the newspapers. And it kind of helps Deep Jewels out. But yeah, she said in her post night interview, she's just taking it one fight at a time. She doesn't want to commit to anything. She wants to be able to just do her best each fight. So she's not going to, I mean, she's an older fighter now. So, but this yeah, win. When they, I'm assuming when uh, somebody, I'm assuming that someone in the media must have asked, like, who would you like to fight next? I'm pretty sure she said, uh, uh, whoever, whoever uh, Sayaki put in front of me or something, she she, she didn't actually. Well, like she, when, 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 when she wants to fight, she didn't have an answer for that. Maybe. Oh, she didn't have a media. She didn't. They only only a couple of the fighters do media. She didn't have one. Um, oh, okay, gotcha. 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 Okay, let's just oh, okay. be let's be direct about it. Kate Lotus used to fight at flyweight, but that's back because before being a mixed martial artist, she was a bodybuilder, so she's bulking up. Now she's no longer a bodybuilder; she's a martial artist. So she's training full time. She lost weight and now she's a straw weight. Um, Japan right now has no straw weights. Huh. The only straw weight around is probably Emi Fujino, who is in Pancrase, and Karen, who is in Pancrase. Every other straw weight has dropped down to atom weight. And there is no way in hell that Kate, Lab- Kate Lotus can make atom weight. Like she'd be a skeleton that walked into the cage if she was an atom weight. And so I think they just looked through the Rolodex for straw weights that were still around. And like, ah, Mika, Mag- Mika Nagano is a straw weight. Maybe we could get her to come out and help Kate develop her career a little bit. I'm pretty, so- I think it's pretty interesting that she went down to straw weight, actually, because like I remember when she went down to 55 kilograms and fought um, Hime and she lost. And I remember she mentioned like, you know, it was my first time fighting at 55 and I actually felt like, you know, dropping this low, I kind of felt like my stamina was running out pretty quickly. So after that comment, I was really surprised that she actually decided to go for straw weight mm-hmm. because like, I guess it seems that she wants to continue in this weight, but I wonder why, like, do you guys have any ideas? <laughs> well, she said she was working out because before this, she was training at a gym in Kobe and now she's training with uh, Andrew's favorite coach, Yakota at um, uh, K-Clan. And I think she was just training so much that she was losing weight. And so they put her down there because I almost earlier this year, I was pretty like, Oh, she's a shoe in for the flyweight tournament. Deep jewels wants her to be popular. They're going to put her in here. She's not Mm going to win, but it'll help make her popular. But 
maybe she looked and saw Rin Nakai in the cage and she saw Shizuka Sugiyama in the cage and she was like, there's no way in hell I can beat these people. I need to drop down to a weight where I'm more realistic. But who knows? I have a Cause... random tangent question. So I was looking at, uh, uh, for, first of all, she's still called the Future Princess. Not Nagano, she stays, or did she earn another nickname? Because I'm pretty sure the Future Princess might be outdated at this point. A lot of fighters in Japan have nicknames that they don't even realize they're nicknames. And um, I think she's one of those that that nickname probably hasn't applied in 10 years. Uh, the other thing, I was, I was looking at her record, and she fought uh, somebody who I'm curious to know if you know what happened to her. Uh, you remember so- Sori Ishioka? Yeah, Saudi Ishioka. Whatever mm-hmm. happened to her after the rise and loss to uh, Miyu? Did she ever... She just disappeared. Well, so you're, just, you're, you're coming across a different phenomenon that happened, which is all of these fighters who fought in Deep Jewels for years and Deep for years and Smack Girl for years and never had a chance to fight on a big stage were all near the ends of their careers. And I feel like Deep, out of kindness to some of these fighters, gave them a chance to have one fight on the big show before they kind of sailed off into the sunset. Because I think Saudi Ishioka, she's married to a karate instructor up in like Nagano, or I think it's Nagano. And I think she just works at his karate gym with her son. So I don't know how serious she is with it. I think they just wanted to have one big fight, like Mika Nagano, who also fought in Rising. I think Deep just gave these fighters one last hurrah at a big show. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I, I saw Saudi Ishioka fight like 10 years ago, and she already had like a foot out the door. I don't think she was that serious about it back then. Gotcha, okay. But, that's a good question. Um, so Anouk, have you ever trained with uh, Kate over at a K clan or anything? I have not, no. But actually, I was, um, we were um, at Ishiwatari san's um, retirement ceremony event. I was mm-hmm. been there because I'm at the gym that he was at. And then there was also like Yokota san's wife. Mm-hmm. And then we were talking and they were like, oh, yeah, you should only come over and train some training. Or like, I think. And then like, or like with AACC also, like they were like, oh, yeah, you can come over and train some time. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I never sure how serious they are so i've never actually went out and right now i can't even they, trade so they all <laughs> but, want you they're all they're all making their appeals to get a new cover of their team <laughs> i was just thinking like strong weight, so i should i should make a point of it to get back as soon as possible because i'm a strong weight, so be careful about uh, about uh training with the other straw weights because then uh, they'll try to say they'll try to make you look bad uh new uh yokata san will try to do will try to pull some yeah. some underhand shit like that if you go over to K-Clan and lose, you probably will be talking about you on the next Rising Confessions video, so you got to be careful. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, but uh, let me think. No, so my the only funny, like, anecdotal Kate Lotus story I have is when Saudi Oshima fought Hime. Um, Saudi Oshima's husband was in the crowd with the kid, with her twins, and had zero control over them. And Kate Lotus was sitting, like, cage side in a leather suit, and these two twins were just climbing all over her. And it was made all the funnier because I don't think Kate Lotus knew who they were. She was like, oh, these babies are just climbing all over me. And she was just like sitting there holding these, like whose kids are these that I'm holding? So that's my only Kate Lotus story. But... Well, Andrew, how do you feel seeing Ushiku in the corner? Was it nice seeing the rising champion at a Deep Jewel show? Oh, yes. You know, uh, you know, would like to see him defend it at some point. Oh, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Rising deep of d- double promotion champion Juntaro Ushiku, you know, but mm-hmm. great representative for the uh, Ryzen and deep uh, jewels, deep, oh, sorry, deep jewels, deep uh, organization. Obviously, it's not deep jewels. Um, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, we have to see him def- defend that title and win by a very close uh, split decision again somewhere so down my, the line. My thoughts are all over the place. So, my last question to you guys about this fight is. Kate Lotus, after the fight, said, and before the fight, that she would come to showcase how her grappling had improved. <laughs> but I remember, I'll never forget an Eddie Bravo interview he did where he talked about teaching strikers jiu-jitsu, where he's like the opposite approach. He was like, avoid it at all cost. You're a striker. If you win this fight, it gives me more time to make you better at jiu-jitsu. Just 
do what you need to do to win, but you're not a jiu-jitsu fighter yet. So that's what all I could think about when I heard her say that. What do you guys think? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think, to be honest, I think she's not bad. She's pretty good mm -hmm. at wrestling. I don't know about the grappling. Like, I've not really seen her, like, do any, like, triangle chokes from below, I think. But, I mean, I think she she's got the physical strength for like the cage wrestling and i i think to be honest she's pretty good but just i'm not gonna always better so i mean I, I guess i mean she wants like what kate lotus wants she wants to go to the top and she keeps saying that as well um so she knows she has to improve on other things like and things other than her striking so i i mean i think she has no choice but to say that she wants to get better jujitsu but i mean i do agree that it would be better for her to because she's probably the better striker out of whatever opponent she got. So she probably should be striking in order to win the fights and then training Judy to, to get better. Yeah. Uh, that's my opinion, I guess. What do you think, Andrew? Do you remember, you know, the interview I'm talking about where Eddie Bravo said one of his guys went to Thailand and came back and was convinced he was a Muay Thai fighter. And uh, Eddie Bravo was like, no, 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 you are not a Muay Thai fighter. You are a Jiu Jitsu fighter. Forget everything that guy said to you. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That is, like, that is so true. Um, have you ever well, rolled, have you ever trained with him? You're a 10th Planet guy. Well, no, because he's in he's in California. He's at 10th Planet HQ all the way in whatever it is. Not in Los Angeles. Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah, San Francisco, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I he came to New York. I, my understanding is that he came to New York when the uh, New York City school opened. But uh, he stays on the West Coast, as far as I know. He just he doesn't he doesn't travel that far at all, except for if it's like a huge ass uh, tournament um, or like I guess ADCC or something like that. He doesn't come over to New York to talk about the nine eleven conspiracy with all you guys. Oh no no oh, no! Uh, or to uh, or to uh, fly around the uh, flat Earth. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, unfortunately not. I've not had I not I've not had the. Uh, opportunity to uh to uh pick his brain pick his brain on science and uh all that stuff all right, well one day one day all right so let's move on to the one of the first the first of three title fights so maybe, it, maybe this is out of order but anuk what do you think of moedi suda versus saudi oshima very interesting like both are very skilled grappler or very skilled on the ground i should say um and Moedi Suda, she actually asked for this title fight after being on, I think, five win streak or something. And I think most or all of them were by submission. So I actually thought because, you know, like, Oshima is just, like, amazing at holding people down and just controlling them on the ground. And then she gets the arm from there or whatever she does. Um, so I was actually pretty excited to, to see how Moedi Suda would do against her because she's also a grappler. Um, then for a second, you got, she got like the height, like the kick in. I was like, whoa, whoa, she could actually even win by striking me because of course she has the height advantages as well. But then, yeah, after all, like, yeah, Oshima just did what she does best and she, she kept her to the ground and then it was all over in a flash. So I'm like, I'm kind of sad. I couldn't get to see more of Moe Suda because I think, I don't know. I just feel like this could have been, you know, she could have done much better better for some reason i don't know why it yeah why saudi got her so fast if it was just really that much of a difference in level or if it was just you know too soon for more to that and she was just too nervous to show her actual skill or something like that what do you think andrew do you think it was a difference in skill or do you think something else happened oh absolutely a difference in skill i think i even said that uh i even said i think that oh that was the way uh, on the preview show that suda had really like was it good? It was gonna be. It was gonna be a clear, uh, decisive victory for uh, Oshima. I think that Oshima right now um, is, you know, other than um, Izawa, you know, you got these are the two future atom weights, or I guess the two atom weights that are gonna be the uh, gonna be at the top of the alternating at the top of the division uh, for as long as uh, as long as they choose to stay there. There's really, you know. I mean, I guess we could still include Ayaka there, um, uh, rotating out of there, Kana occasionally, depending on who she fights. 
But right now, yeah, it's now it's it's, it's the Oshima Izawa uh, show. I would love to see that. I would love to see that. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, eventually no. that has to happen. You know, I wouldn't be. And I'm. I, I w- if I'm uh, Sakaki Bara, I would tell Sayaki, "No, you're not doing that fight first. I'm doing that fight first, homie." Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, hope you know. We definitely have to, you know, see, you know, eventually down the line, who is the top of the top of between those two. Did you guys? Did you guys get the impression that like Saudi Oshima is like big sistered Moetti? She was oh, just absolutely. like, oh. Yeah. You think you know about grappling? I've been doing judo for 23 years. I'm going to throw you down and never let go of your arm and make you regret all of your decisions. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it seemed like to me when I watched it. But also, I thought it was I thought- how, like, um, she was about to, like, she just kept looking at the judge, like, are you not going to stop it? Yeah. I'm like, does mm-hmm. that, did that, because I, I was wondering, like, did that mean, like, she was actually holding back because she didn't want to break her arm? Or was it more like, don't you think you should stop it? Like, or was it actually? See, that's I, w- I was really intrigued by that. <laughs> like, I was getting flashbacks of Frank Mir versus Nogueira, and I was like, please stop it, please stop it, because that's one of the most disgusting bone breaks I've ever seen. Why and... is everybody so squeamish here? This is MMA. No, no, we're all used to broken bones, and you have to. I know, I know, but you have to admit that Frank Mir is the one guy who like never waited for people to tap. He was just like, I'm going to rip your arm off and you should have tapped 10 seconds ago. Yeah, no, but not. no, but because uh, Moody Suda, I think, I don't know how to feel about Moody Suda because the win over Hikaru Aono was like such a big kind of shock to my system. I'm like, oh, she defeated a legitimate fighter. But maybe that's just Hikaru Aono failing to evolve as a grappler. And I know before the fight, I interviewed Saudi and she said when she first started, she was afraid of jiu-jitsu fighters. But now that she's trained with some high-level jiu-jitsu, she's not afraid of them at all. Oh, you listen, Suda, Suda is like, how old is she? Like 11 or 12? I don't know. But like, she's very young. She's very yeah. young. She has year unless she quits. I don't think she's going to quit anytime soon. She has no. years to develop no, and no. become... To, a, a top five Adam weight in her division. Listen, yeah. she still has a win over your uh, your your girl uh, Hikaru Ono. So you know, yeah. listen, she she beat uh somebody who you would think would be the better grappler in that case. Um, hey, it's not my girl, but it's Shuta Watanabe's girl, and I don't want anyone to ever get that confused. Okay, uh, okay. Who is also fighting on the next deep card? So. Props to Shuto Watanabe, a very exciting fight. So I've never fought on a Shuto card. I don't know why. I'm very that 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 bothers me more than it should. Because Shuto sucks, and we all know it. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm just kidding. No, Shuto is actually doing better recently. I'm I'm much happier with their product now that they've left one championship's wing, and Shuto has become Shuto again, much better. But yeah, so yeah, Moedi Suda's dad is her jiu-jitsu coach. He runs a martial arts gym, so I expect oh, her to be around good. for a while. That's never good when you're when when you're under the tutel. Uh, it, was he in her corner? If you don't mind me asking, what, oh was. god, that's never. I I I have learned that a lot of fa- a lot of family members who train are in your corner. That's usually a never. That's usually never. Usually not a good thing. Ever heard of Tiger? Ever heard of Tiger Woods, Andrew? Uh yes, that's different. He wasn't getting punched in the face uh, for his uh for a living. Yeah. And Tiger developed some little quirks of his own, but um, what's her name? Like the the one championship, um, Angela, Angela Lee. Lee? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a whole family. Oh. Well, I mean, that's what happens when you're Chinese or Canadian or Hawaiian or whatever one championship decides to market you as at the current moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, four billion um, fans. Yeah, it works for her. Yeah, you know, that means seven billion fans watching every event. Um. All right, yeah, so big news, I guess we can kind of discuss. Saudi Oshima said she might not be able to fight anymore. What do you guys think of that? I wasn't... Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Oh, yes. No, I was just shocked. I was like, whoa, I, 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 want, I didn't see that one coming. And I was wondering what she was referring to. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that's just my personal guess. Maybe it has to do with her children or like maybe finances with her husband also being like a judoka and stuff like that but I was shocked because she seemed like you know it came out of nowhere like oh I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do this I'm like oh really what what happened you know well I know the details so her husband is a professional judo guy 
And in Japan, a professional judo guy meet is kind of Watanabe did as well. Is a company, a big company hires you and you're like an employee of the company, but they just pay you to pr- practice judo all the time. Mm-hmm. And then when you retire, they just move you to a position within the company and you work for the company. And so when her, she and her husband are diehard judo guys and her husband, I believe, won an all Japan tournament when he was younger. And she got, I think, like third place. But when they got married, she apparently promised to support his judo career. And ever since she started competing in MMA, he hasn't won. She did mention that. And um, they get by on his judo money. Like, she doesn't make a lot of money in MMA. And so the day of this fight, he fought in the All Japan tournament in Japan and lost in the first round. And so she was like crying when she came into the venue. She was very emotional that she thinks she's like broken this promise to support him in his judo career. And if he cannot continue doing judo, the company will likely transfer him to the countryside and she will no longer be able to train in Tokyo. And so that's all the stuff she's been thinking about. That's why she's a lot, a lot on her mind. So gosh. Plus, she has to juggle the twins, so she has a lot going on. What do you think about the announcement, Andrew? Um, I'm always hesitant when I hear about retirements. I know Japan's a little bit different. Hey, I remember in the 90s, you used to have the uh, the Joshi uh, women wrestlers who would all retire before like the age of 28 or 29, 30, something like that. Uh so I'm guessing usually retirements when someone says, well, here's the thing. She didn't say she is definitely retiring. She says, I might not, she said like, I might not have to do this anymore. I might not be able to do this anymore. Or I, what was her exact wording? Do you remember? I think she's worried that she won't be, able, she wants to do it. She loves competing. The reason she got back in MMA was because she was jealous that her husband was doing martial arts all the time and that she wasn't able to do anything. And so she wants to do it. She's just worried if she's able to do it. Hmm. I mean, I, it, if she does, I'm kind of a little bit baffled that, she, unfortunately, she sounds like, I guess they have, if her husband does get transferred for, or whatever to the, uh, to whatever village they, maybe that he has to go to. I mean, it would, I mean, she, she could have. She wouldn't have to give up entirely, right? There's gotta be like, I mean, you know, there's probably. I'm. Pr- there's gotta be something like, you know, within. Well, you bring like, a good point in that the most impressive thing about Saudi Oshima is how little she trains. So when you talk to her about her training schedule, it's like I go to AACC once a week, I go to a striking coach once a week, and I do jujitsu once a week because her schedule is so busy. She's not. You're just like. What would how good would she be if she was training full time? Like questions like that start to enter your mind. So you're right. Maybe if she went out to the countryside, she could find like I know Kawajiri has a gym out in the countryside. Maybe she could find somewhere to keep it going. Um, I mean, I'll say, you know, personally, I hope she doesn't have to retire. Um, it would be uh it would kind of be uh Kind of, it would suck for the atom weight division because it would, yeah. like I was just saying before, we would lose, I, we would lose someone who is maybe number two uh, in the world right now, or at least in Japan. Well, yeah, the I declared twenty twenty one kind of the year of Oshima and Izawa. So yeah, hopefully she can stick around because she's a future star. As I said, she's a very popular fighter. She has a lot of supporters, and. People like her, so hopefully she keeps going. But we will not know until she makes her decision or the company decides to transfer her husband or something. But we can move on to your favorite fighter, Andrew, King Reyna. And a rematch, a year in the making against Yoko Higashi, a fight that could also be labeled as deep versus pan craze with the featherweights. What did you think of this fight, Anuk? So I... Just say I didn't. I don't think I watched the entire first fight between the two, but I do know that it was marketed as like Pancreas against Jeep. But I think 
Higashioko is now officially a deep fighter, as I as they were saying in the comments. Um, yeah, very. It was actually my so it was my first time seeing Higashioko fight, and it was good. I yeah, I mean she she obviously also trained a lot, and King Nena. Yeah, I mean she's just like you know. I liked King Nena's mentality, like she kept pushing forward and kept trying so she didn't give up, but just stamina wise and just like, you know, Higashioko was clearly more calm and more controlled and executing her game plan uh, very well. And also what I think was very interesting is if I, I think if I heard it correctly in, um, so like after the fight, um, so I think her coach was Yokota-san also for yeah. King Nena. Um, and I think he was mentioning something like, that's because you don't train enough. Like he was kind of scolding her for like not training enough. And she was like really crying. Like, oh, I lost. So I was like, well, okay. She does kind of fit her image of like being like the, I would say like the Yankee, or like the yeah. rebel. <laughs> like, so yeah, but I mean like props to Yashioko. She had like, she showed like a really great fight. So I'm, I'm, and she has a great personality as far as I could tell. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of her fights. She's a very so. yeah, interesting fighter. So I'm glad Anuka brought that up. Anuka brought that up because Deep Jewels did release the behind the scenes footage, which is where that clip is from. And for the do- for those that don't know, King Reina used to train at a gym. I forget which gym it was. It might have been Hearts with Kenji Osawa, and there was allegedly some problems where she was forced to leave that gym. And then she went and started training at a gym in Shibuya. And by gym, I mean, it was a bar that had a cage in it and people could drink and watch amateur fights. Mm. And that was where she was training. And now she is training at K-Clan and she's kind of always had this reputation as being incredibly flaky. Uh, And I don't know how, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a rising confession video where the rising staff said she was like five hours late to come meet them to take her or something take them to show her their apartment or something. So yeah, I think she has a very flaky reputation and maybe that's why Yokota was really upset with her because he, and Sayaki also was kind of upset with her in the post fight comments because Deep clearly wanted King Renan to win because she's a deep grown <laughs> fighter. And she, in their minds, like she didn't fight the fight to win. It was almost like a pro wrestling, like I'm going to show you how tough I am performance. What do you think, Andrew? You know, I don't count the uh, the the T T F win for uh, Reina simply because Reina was like ten times bigger than Tia, <laughs> so I know that was her last win technically. She also opened the fight with a cheap shot. Oh God, I don't I don't even remember that. When uh, Tia came out to touch her uh, touch gloves, King Reina punched her in the face and took her down. Oh. <laughs> I don't know that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Oh, well, fuck that. That's really that's awful. Um, uh, but oh, I was like, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So I don't think I, I don't know if I can remember the last time when somebody went to a better gym and devolved as a fighter. I can't remember the last time. Like I know it's happened before, but like, but King Rainer is the current example of like somebody who went from a whatever gym that thing was that you just described to now K clan, which is an established gym and seemingly has like, I don't know. I don't know what's what she's doing and, and all that, but she is so, I hesitate to say awful, but like she is so, she is so devolved to a think- point where I'm starting to lose inch. I like the gimmick when I first saw her rising. I thought the gimmick was great. I thought her, I thought kind of like her, her whole thing and her whole approach to fight was just something so interesting. She was doing open weight fights against girls that are like six feet tall and 200 pounds. And she was like five foot three and all that stuff. I thought like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. I like what this whole thing. And now like seemingly fighting legitimate competition she is she is not stacking up against them she's losing against some bet some of them 
badly, very, very badly. And I just am, I am starting to, I might have to punch my ticket off the, uh, to get off the, the King Raina train because it's starting to, uh, I'm starting to lose my interest in her whole, in her whole thing. Well, I think she's, she's, she's very similar to Kana Asakura in the level that King Raina's base is judo. And she was a good judoka when she was in high school. But Yoko Higashi was a much better judoka who went to college for judo and had to drop out when she got injured. And so when King Rena fights someone who is also good at judo, she like shuts down. She has nothing to do. And she just does this weird, like aggressive chase. She doesn't try to cut them off. She just kind of chases them in the worst possible way and eats punches the whole time coming in. Which oh, is yes, what happened the, the in the kind of Watanabe, uh, Watanabe uh, school striking, I believe it's called. <laughs> well, King Reina has a better chin, but yes, it is the same oh, school yeah. striking. And um, yeah, so she just walks forward. She doesn't try to cut or do anything. She just gets hit in the face a lot. In the first fight, she actually got hit worse. She was bleeding out of her, it looked like she had bleeding out of her mouth and her nose, but yeah. yeah, she just eats a lot of punches. So the problem with that is now that Corona's over, the reason that Pancras and Deep put these two together is because this division doesn't exist in Japan. King Reina, outside of Yoko Higashi, has fought like one other Japanese fighter. All of her other opponents have been foreign. And I think Yoko Higashi has fought like two Japanese fighters four times. And then all of her other opponents have been foreign fighters. And so Deep is going to have to bring in foreign talent for these girls to fight. And they've already fought each other twice. So I don't expect to see them fight each other again. But Yoko Higashi has a fan base, which I didn't realize. So I expect to see her back fighting. She trains at Miwi. So I, I mean, when she won, her second was Yukari Nabe, who was very emotional in the crowd. And um, yeah, so I mean, she trains at a good gym and she's got good fans. So I expect to see her back. Did, uh, please, please, uh, you might remember, but did was it Cyborg or did King Reyna challenge one or the other? Cyborg Miwi. challenged King Reyna. Why? It's, it would make no sense at this point. Because Cyborg's management has always been idiotic in everything they do. Oh, okay. You remember Not the bad. Tito worked when Tito was her manager and he made her do that weigh-in? Yes. To prove that she was fat, but okay. Um, yeah, they make no sense, but yeah. So, so I, I got to, so what is it? So other than a, a, another rematch against Higashi or um, Marina What's her name? Marina Kumagai or Kumagi? What's her name? The, the, oh, Marina Kumagai, the kickboxer Kumagai. who. Yeah, uh, another rematch between those two. Maybe this time in MMA. Yeah. Like, what do you do with King Rain at this point? We're like, you bring, you bring I, in I foreign guess... fighters and let her let you bring in some big girls from Thailand and Korea, and you let King Rain smash them. You bring in like a Taekwondo girl from. Thai, uh, Korea, you bring in some Thai boxers from Thailand. She uses her judo. She smashes them. They get her four or five wins and then they try to get her to go back up into Ryzen. Well, here's the thing as well. Um, even if like there is a blueprint to beat Reyna, and I'll, I'll even say this. Um, who, who's, uh, who's the person who, uh, who books uh, Invicta who fought Reyna? I'm forgetting her name. Um, oh, Shayna Baszler fought King Reyna. No, not Shayna Baszler. Um, they fought in Ryzen. I think I think it was King Reyna's last fight in Ryzen. She never fought Judy Kedzie, who's the Invicta FC matchmaker. Who the fuck? Who, who I'm thinking of then? Um, oh, but uh, she fought. Did she fight Cindy Dandois? Who did she fight? Yeah, she fought Cindy Dandois. Who I'm. Um, that's not who I'm thinking of. Um, uh, oh, Kate Young, uh, Caitlin Young. Caitlin Young. Yes, yes. Uh, I thought she I, she was a booker for Invicta, right? I thought she was. She was. She was the one that yeah. got the Tiffany Van Hoost over from, right? That was it. That was it. So, yeah. So, uh, I remember that fight, and you th would think that, you know, oh, King Reyna, Judo, win. But no, you know, Caitlin Young obviously came there with a game plan to not get Judo, to not get judo So So, mm. the thing is that even if you bring in these Thai, so assume these Thai or foreign fighters have actual good coaches, they just look at all the ways that Reyna's lost. Like, oh, okay. Just don't let her grab you. I don't you think know? they're going to find fighters that do that. I think they're going to find people that she can beat and build her back up and try to get her some comic book style fights and rising or something. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, if they can, you know, you know, good for them, you know, it's, but like, yeah, this king, the King Reina thing is starting to, uh, start. I'm, I'm now on the Higashi train, presuming, you know, if Deep Duels even does anything with Higashi at this point, I, like you said, it's probably, yeah. it's like, it's going to be all foreign fighters at this point. It has to be all foreign fighters who come in, right? Maybe who is that? Is that at this point, there's a few fighters who've come up from amateur at the featherweight division. So there's mm-hmm. like Saika Juicy. Uh, oh my god, oh, don't even. My favorite fighter. My favorite fighter, Juicy. I'm, I'm not talking about the level. I'm just talking didn't, about like there are people. <laughs> didn't she fight one. today? I think she fought today. Oh, was that today? Oh, wait. Yeah, that was today. I she fought the other girl who went up. She just, uh, that was her pro debut. The other girl. I are you, you going to suggest Po Chan Z also come in and fight King Rena? Yes, well, please. Yeah. I want Po Chan Z as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are fighters, but like there's a difference in level. But if you right. give them time, then there could be some new, you know, people well, coming up in the featherweight division. I'll take Juicy versus uh, King Rena. I'll take Juicy versus King Rena. I'll be I'm happy actually, to watch that. Juicy makes sense because I think Juicy is a big shit talker who comes from like some type of entertainment background. I think as far as what I know about Juicy is that she apparently watched MMA on television. She was like, this is cool. I want to do this. And then she went on to fight one amateur fight against uh, Pochan and she won that. And then she she and Pochan became pros. Pros, And then um, actually it was funny because like, she was met, she was actually fighting at lightweight first. Um, Juicy was, and then uh, she was saying the after the fight like interview thing. She was saying like, oh, "I'm thinking of dropping my weight and fighting Kate Lotus next." And I was like, "Oh, that's so funny!" But then actually she dropped weight, so I'm kind of starting to think like maybe she was kind of serious and she wants to drop her weight and fight like people who are in like the flyweight division or whatever. Actually, I got a great fight, CJ. I yeah. it will never happen. So I'm pretty sure she retired from MMA. Do you remember, do you know the stardom wrestler Yoshiko? I, that is hilarious you bring that up because that's who I was thinking of. Yoshiko, she I'm was the wrestler sorry. that did a shoot style match. And beat oh, no, the not shoot style. Out. She shot on her opponent. She like, yeah. like legit broke her yeah, face. Yeah, she beat the shit out of her opponent. And then Road FC brought her over and she knocked out a couple Korean girls. Yeah, so if I'm uh, Sayaki... Uh, I'm go. I would, I would do my darndest if because if you want to make an interesting fight with King Reina and a fight she could win, that's that's something that if you know when you get when you hear like oh you get the uh, internet talking get you know mm-hmm. that will get the internet talking. Didn't Yoke is her name? I forget her name, but didn't she lose a ton of weight that wrestler? Yes, exactly. Just like King Reina did. So it makes it makes you know listen you know. They're both they and they're both the same height, I believe. They're both be short. Yeah, that'd be a good some, some um, good shit talking because before this fight, King Reina kind of mumbled in her breath that she was going to kill Yoko. So get some more uh, talking between you and. That's the thing as well. Uh, I I don't watch really the press conferences and all that stuff, but at least from her demeanor when she walked out, it seems like King Reina has lost a lot of inner self confidence in herself. I feel like. Well, yeah, I mean, her record kind of reflects that as well. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 very, very but much. Moving on to the main, they don't have an infographic for it, I guess, because um, they don't make it beforehand. We'll just go back to this, I guess. So, um, yeah, Rin Nakai versus Shizuka Sugiyama. What are your thoughts on Nick on the fight? What do you think of the first? Uh, Sugiyama kind of had an interesting strategy. It looked like her plan was to not grapple with Nakai at all and try to keep on the outside. But what do you think of the fight? Mm, I mean, again, just Nakaeding dominating. Um, I, I, to be honest, I couldn't really tell what Sugiyama's plan was, but I mean, it would make sense for her to, to, to go striking because she has the obvious height advantage. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. How to say? It's kind of like it's kind of these fights we watching. Like I don't know why, but somehow she lost. You know. <laughs> Like she, she wasn't really making any big mistakes in my eyes, but yeah, she got to the ground and yeah, I don't know. Maybe she just, she wasn't a, alert enough to Nakainin coming in for the takedown and she was too focused on getting in her striking, but yeah. yeah. She was like, 
Andrew, what do you think of Ren Nakai's grappling? She's like a spider monkey on the ground. I almost feel like her short limbs are an advantage because it makes it easier for her to pass. I, I think so too. I definitely think so too. I she I don't think she. I mean, unless I'm wrong, and she is, she doesn't look the most flexible. But uh, yeah. but when it her lack of flexibility, uh, definitely like she makes up for it, for it in just I think pure I like to call it grappling strength because there's a big difference between you know you know uh, Puds uh, you know whatever that big Polish guy whatever his name is Puds, Puds whatever, congratulations you know, on the uppercut yeah. knockout Puds exactly. Between his type of strength and somebody who has great grappling strength, as uh, Nakai has, and I'm pretty sure Anuk as well, who's you know trains with all the people at Cave, she probably she can attest to that as well. That there's just a big difference, and Nakai knows how to do it so well. Um, and you would think, you know, somebody if you look at her, you'd think like, oh, you know, this, you know, she's short and and muscular, you know. Obviously, that means she can't do triangles because she's got short legs. Her legs are big. She can't do it. She's got short arms. She can't, or like something like that. But like, she knows what her strengths are as a grappler. And you know, I, I wonder. I don't know if it would have had. Ha, I I wish Sugiyama had fought beforehand because I, yeah. I I don't know if the I don't know if this fight would have been any different. Uh, but like it's we you know like you said, uh, Nakai is a slow is a slow starter. So, but I wonder, like, if what the pace or how it would have been any different had Sugiyama had had fight herself. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She basically had to wait in that arena for you know I don't know if she what she was doing or whatever, but you know she had she didn't have uh, the same her body didn't go through the same rigors that Nakai did. If that makes if that oh, makes yeah. any sense. Well, then I mean. Um... Nakai also was reportedly injured going into the event. So it's kind of it, well, interesting to was see. Was the injury again? Was it her hand, I think? I don't know was if she revealed her... the exact injury, but the injury is why she pretty much only grappled and didn't do striking. So a hand would make sense. Her knees mm -hmm. are pretty taped up as well, I noticed. Well, she got the cute mocha knees. <laughs> she has terrible knees. She was, a, when she went to college for judo, she had, she had a, had a career ending knee injury in college. And that's why she stopped doing judo her freshman year of college. So I think her, like, if you don't, I don't know if you remember, cause you're young, but Ayaka Hamasaki used to also have like zombie like legs, like just uh, mummy legs. And then she had dual knee surgeries to fix it. So Nakai Reen also, I think has bad knees mm -hmm. and she just tapes the hell out of them. Okay. Uh, so I guess I got a question for both of you. Um, were you surprised by the outcome and just like how it went between Nakai and Sugiyama? Because I think this was this was a fight that Deep was praying to the gods happens, and I think a lot of, I think a lot more people were interested in. So, yeah, did you, was this did this fight go the way that you thought it would go? Well, I think that Deep wanted Sugiyama to win because Sugiyama has always been kind of a deep girl, and Nakai Reen's kind of been notoriously difficult to, to work with. Plus, she comes from more of a pancreas background. But um, I was surprised how quickly Nakai Rain got Sugiyama in an armbar position because Sugiyama escaped from the first one. But still, like, she was in an armbar almost immediately. And I was like, oh, she's in a lot of trouble <laughs> as soon as I saw that because Nakai Rain just didn't stop going for armbars until she had one. I don't want to say anything bad about Sugiyama because I know you like her, but like yeah. I, I, I can't help but wondering, like, because her last fight against um, Nico Nirvana, also she got armbarred, right? Right. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how? It, I mean, I, I can't say that much, but to me, it seems like why does she get into armbar positions that quickly? Like, maybe is it like she underestimates? She thinks like, oh, I can escape from that and it's fine, but or is that just something that she's always been like? I don't want to be a Sugiyama apologist or like def like overly defensive. It's being seen that way. But I think the Miko Nirvana fight was very different in that I think that Sugiyama felt like a responsibility to make the fight as exciting as possible mm. and was going for like way over aggressive ground and pound. 
And that's how she got in the armbar trouble. That's true. Whereas Red Nakai is an armbar machine. Like it's her go-to submission. And I think when Red Nakai yeah, got her down, I think Red Nakai threw her and was already in side control when mm-hmm. she got her to the ground. I also just want to that 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 arm bar that uh, Nirvana did put on. I don't think that was properly applied. I really, I know, I know a lot of these uh, one twenty fivers are very flexible and all that, but I don't think that that it just the difference. If you watch the difference between the one that uh, that uh, submitted Sugiyama versus the one that Nirvana put down, you'll see there is a major ton of difference between how how Sugiyama is reacting between the two. Yeah. Plus, I mean. I know that Nakai Rain, her corner, have kind of obsessed with Sugiyama and Watanabe Kana for years. So yeah. you have to think that they've been like preparing for this fight for like honestly like 15 years or something. So it was interesting. But so what do you guys think next for Nakai Rain? I'm sure you saw her tweets and stuff after the fight. Well, obviously the UFC, that's what she wants to do. So obviously, you know, I'm sure the UFC's got that contract all written up for her and is ready to uh to sign Ring Nakai to their to their 125 division where she get two or three wins and then fight uh, Shevchenko. Of course not. No, no, I, I have no <laughs> idea. I, I honestly have no idea. Um, but then there also, didn't you also mention something about um, that? She wants to train in the United States, but like she wants to be invited or something. Well, that's my thing is. So right now on Japanese YouTube, a new can probably attest to this. A ton of Japanese fighters have gone to train in the U.S. recently. Oh yes! Oh my God! It's 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 like a it's like a whole excursion. Well, it's a trend, like, right? So Kai Asakura goes, and then everyone's like, "Oh, we should go train in the U.S." I think so that's- now Abima is like filming a TV show of Itsuki training in the U.S. with her brother, and Mikuru went to go train, not to be outdone, went to go train there as well, and now Takeda is yeah. also there training as well. I'm killing bullshit on the, on the Mikuru stuff. I did. There was, was there any video footage of him actually training? Because I always saw his vi- footage of him on the beach in Hawaii. So I'm calling bullshit. I, I just like to think that Mikuru was just in Hawaii hoping that Japanese tourists would recognize him. Oh, so he could act that. like he was famous in the US too. But fuck that. Where yeah. Kai seemed to actually be training and Itsuki seems to legitimately be only training. That's all she seems to be doing in the US. Yeah. So very different. We got. Kanako, we got Mizuki, Naoki, Sato, Itsuki, the Japanese well, we got- princess and her lover. They're all uh, fleeing to New York City. Oh, yes, the Japanese princess and her lover who can't pass a bar uh, <laughs> for his life. Um, wait, okay, so, okay, so obviously the, uh, in, uh, well, Naoki, I know, is back at Longo's. I think Oka, though, is still in Japan, though. I don't think he came back as far as I know. Um, right. Okay, I saw uh, I saw the photo. Uh, I, I think it was I think that was uh, Kanako on the super strong machine mask. I'm assuming. Yes, it um, was. Uh, well, by the way, her arm looks great. By the way, it looks like her arms recovered. That's that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, Hirata was she also part of that whole gang as well? Yeah, she's also at Longos with her brother. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Um. Well, here's, well, it seems like the usual suspects are back in New York, but it seems like all the rest were doing stuff in California. I saw, obviously, Kai in mm-hmm. California. Um, well, I think Kai see. was what? Kai was in Vegas. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Vegas. Vegas. Um, who, no, I'm thinking of uh, Yuki uh, Submission Takahashi, uh, the guy right. from Shuto. Uh, yeah. He was doing uh, training at uh, 10th Planet Oceanside. You know, I, I wonder if this is – I don't know if it's a minor trend or this is going to be like, oh, you know, but I think there's going to be a lot more fighters that are going to do this. I think a lot, I hope a lot, and I, they really should. I did say that, you know, uh, I, I liked, uh, I listened to what you said on the, um, with uh, Shu about Kano Watanabe. And here's the thing, Kano Watanabe does like a, 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 like a year or two training in America. She can just, feel, she can be, she will, she'll stop falling into the same traps as she does mm-hmm. uh, in all of her fights. Throughout her career, um, yeah. I, I, you know, we got a new. We got uh, a nuke said uh, you're going to be doing some traveling as well. Uh, so it seems like everybody's coming to the United States to do some training. And I think what it was Takeda is at what the UFC Hawaii 
with BJ Penn or something? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you so, got but, you got tension. Eventually, so I think he said he's going to move to the U.S. to train boxing. At, isn't that what he said? Or that was my impression. That's probably was. So Anouk, what were you going to say? I'm sorry, I cut you off. I don't even remember. No, I. Yeah. Where do you want to share? Where are you going to train in the U.S.? Do you think? Who? What? Me? Yeah. Oh, are I can't. Any... I can't train right now because I'm still in oh, right. rehabilitation. So unfortunately, I'm going to be just visiting. That's too bad. Visiting that's Marcelo right. Garcia for sure. But well, you, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need your legs to practice chokes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep it. What was his know. famous submission called, Andrew? The Marcelo team? Yeah, the Marcelo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah the uh, whatever uh, his variation, the guillotine. Um, also, he does. Also, he's also famous for the north south. He has a very very tight north south choke. More famous than Jeff the Monson. First, the first person who did it. Um, Wait, does, doesn't Atari also have a wicked north south choke? No, yes. it's uh, Akira, I think. Oh, Akira. Okay. I mean, I don't know about Ishu Atari Sam, but I think he actually he, he he did get a north south submission once. I think I don't know if it's his specialty, but I know Akira does really good north souths. I've always said that the north south choke is something that like you either have to be so skilled in to do, or just be just have big 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 ass shoulders to to get away with, uh, and it w- without the technique. So yes, definitely Akira is somebody who who's a who I can tell. Can do a north south choke without even having to properly apply it. Yeah, so um, I think we got on this train because Nakai Rain is saying mm-hmm. she wants to train in the U.S., but she wants someone to invite her to come train in the U.S. Where I think Japanese <laughs> fighters now are just realizing I should take my career into my own hands and just go make the opportunity myself and go train in the U.S. So if she wants to train there, she should just go train there. Yes, like go to for- go to Florida, ATT, go to wherever Alliance in California. It's like the other thing. Well, uh, here's the thing: is well, where does she? What's her uh, main gym? Um, oh, it's a, got- it's a, it's like a shoot something sh- a wild Usami Shuto <laughs> gym in Shikoku. Okay, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing: is I don't know about so. Let's assume that like Mikuru or. Uh, Nakai does. I I feel like these are people who don't who get don't get told what you're doing is absolutely wrong a lot, yeah. and so that's the other thing is that they'll if you have a good coach, they will tell you honestly what you're doing wrong. And I don't know if somebody like Nakai is used to being told, oh no, that what that that technique is horrible. You're not supposed to you're not supposed to uh to kick that far away. Uh, from your opponent or something like that, like she tried to with Misha Tate. Um, so that's the other thing is that if she wants to train the U.S., she's got to learn that's a different. Coaches have a much different mentality here, and regardless of like how of what your record is or or who you beat and all that stuff. And I'll be honest, I'm I'm not even gonna put Nakai in that category because I guarantee if Nakai came to any gym in the United States. I guarantee that probably 10 out of 10 gyms would not know who she is. So, um, you know what? She's probably better. You know, if she wants to go to any gym, you know, I would just say, yeah, go to ATT. You already got Kyoji Horiguchi there. So you got, you got Japanese kindred spirits there as well. That's probably the best gym, you know, if she wants to actually train in the United States. So we got a little update. Jamie piped in that Isu Atari beat Oka Sasaki with a North South choke. Oh, oh yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, I remember that. So, I almost feel like Nakai Rain would do better at a smaller gym because I think if she goes, she's probably going to bring Wild Usami with her. So I think I would almost if I, if I was her, I'd just go to like Thailand or New Zealand and work on my striking at one of those good gyms, and then she's maybe so go to good, America. Though. She's what? so good at grappling. I almost don't feel like she even needs to improve on her grapple on her striking. Her well, grappling- I mean, just improve the striking defense just to be able to get more confident in the grappling, if that makes sense. Oh, I got you. I got you. I'm not saying like turn into uh Damien Maya where he thought he was a boxer for four years. You no, know, just sh- shell up the defenses, stop throwing teep kicks from five feet away and uh, get the grappling going. Yeah. But um, oh, yeah. Final thoughts on the event there. Anuk? I know I started growing a little late, but what do you think of the event in general? And, 
I'll ask this. I'll also ask this question. What did you think of the event? And what fights would you like to see on the next Deep Jewels card? For the event, I think it was pretty nice. I think all of the fights, in my opinion, were very skilled in their own different ways. Um, also thoughts, I'm really interested to see what come, becomes of Nakaidin after this, because she really wants to go to UC, but can she do that? Or is she going to go somewhere else first? Or is she going to stay in jewel, Deep Jewels? Um, and what I would like to see next, I would definitely like to see Okay, this is going to sound really rude, but I would like to see someone beat Izase. <laughs> He's unbeatable. I'm like, this is impossible. This is, I, I need to see someone beat her because. Do you think Rising lets her fight in Deep Jewels again? Or do you think she's a Rising fighter now? Oh, no. I mean, I, I probably, I mean, she has to defend her Deep Jewels belt as well, doesn't she? At some point. Her Deep Jewels strawweight belt? Like, who's going to fight her? Kate Lotus? There's no one else in the division. <laughs> Okay, well, then I'm going to make my comeback and I'm going well, to. There you go. <laughs> oh, wait, that makes me the one who needs to be exotic. No, I would really love to see, like, for instance, the Saudi Oshima versus her. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. That'd be else? a great fight. I would like to see Pochan Z, Z, Pochan Z win. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe she won today. She's fighting today. So she yeah. fought today. So I don't know what the results are yet, but. See, but I would like to see her win. Also, who else would I like to see? Mm, yeah, I guess that's it for now. All the things that pop up in my head right now. Some solid choices. Andrew, what do you think of the show and what fights would you like to see on the next Deep Jewels card? Uh, I thought, well, you know, this is, I want to also say I didn't watch this on YouTube. I actually managed to buy this through the Spawn or whatever website it's called. Um, and so this is my first time ever actually buying a deep, deep tools, whatever. And yeah, I, I thought, you know, it'll move along very fast. You know, I'll say this, you know, there's no, there's no extraneous bullshit in a, in a deep, I'm assuming that, that for the most part, that doesn't happen in any right. deep or deep tool shows. They just keep it moving along because they want to get up. They don't want to pay overtime at Kurrican or something like that. Oh, they have she, another event lined up. They got to. Get everything cleaned up for the next event that starts in an hour. Oh, yeah. They got to clean up the blood and all that. I got you. I got you. Actually, so I didn't even know there was a Deep Jewel show today because Tapology didn't have it. So I, I I was totally unaware that there was another show going on today. There is not a Deep Jewel. It's a Deep Impact show that has women fighters on oh. it. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 okay. I, I didn't even know there was a Deep Impact show. I don't even I think, think that, that... Emi does Tomimatsu that. is fighting Yuko Kiryu in the main event. There's two events today. <laughs> There's two events. There's one a morning event and an afternoon event. Oh, okay, gotcha. Your girl, Marina oh. Kumagai, is fighting, I believe, who is operating the uh, TriStar expansion gym into Japan. Oh, oh, interesting. Oh. Um, overall, yeah, overall, yeah, I thought, I thought, it, was a, I thought it was good. Um, in terms of, you know, listen, I don't know about Deep Jewels, but listen, if Bellator has any sort of brains behind their booking – I book Ring Nakai and, and Kana Watanabe for Bellator in the Japan show, like later this year, potentially. Awesome. If um, I was them, that's exactly what I would do. But it has to be in Japan. It can't be on like some Mohegan Sun card on the mm -hmm. prelims. Like if you do that, that's like, I don't know. Or Stupid. they could do it on one of those India. Because didn't Bellator used to do all of their events at Indian casinos so they could avoid the athletic commissions? Oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Was, was it Bobby Lashley that always fought on their Indian commission cards? Yep, I think it was. I think it was, yeah. So they need some <laughs> of those Indian commission cards if they're going to bring Rin Nakai over, you know, <laughs> give her a friendly environment. King Reina, I don't know. I guess, again, I don't know. Rem I don't know. Yeah, against some, some Thai yeah. lady who's 145 or maybe 135, but is walking around 145 or against uh po chan z I, I don't know who i don't know what else to do with her um i'm a higashi's now deep tools uh yes. exclusive um i don't know higashi versus po chan z i'm i am at a loss <laughs> I, I don't know juicy i i am at a loss who you put who you put against anybody at this division um 
I hope Oshima does not retire. I yeah. really don't. I think eventually, I here's the thing, I'll say this before she has to retire. If she here, so okay, so let's just say she does. I think you then have to fast track the Izawa match between those two, whether it be in Deep Jewels or Ryzen. Yeah. So, because that is a fight that I think would get a lot of people interested in. You know, it'd be great for Deep Jewels because I think it would get a lot of attention, mm -hmm. but I would not be surprised if Ryzen like slipped, uh, slipped Sayaki, you know, and just be like, hey, listen, we're booking that fight first. Or, uh, yeah. You know, uh, up for the others, I don't know. Kyoka, I don't know what you do with Kyoka. 0 3 at this point. Furuse, maybe, even though Furuse would probably win. I know you, you said that she wins the fight. She, she, she loses the fight, she should win, and then wins the fight, she shouldn't, right? She has that yeah. weird. Uh, would you put Kyoka against Nisei or someone like that? She wouldn't win, I think. Yeah, I don't think she'd win either. Nisei's way bigger. Yeah. What about Kyoka? What about Kyoka versus Kimrena? <laughs> no. <laughs> you fought her, Anuk. What div is is Saki a strawweight? Saki, um, I actually don't know because I heard some rumors that maybe she moved up to pro, but I'm not sure. Yeah, she's, she's pro now. Pro she's pro now, so officially. Mm -hmm. She hasn't fought, has she yet? Topology glitched out. Topology has like six separate pages for Saki, and they have her record split across all of them. Oh, so God. her records look impossible to follow on Topology. But um, yeah, she's a strong she's... weight, but she might be going down because if you become pro, it's going to be way way before the actual match day, so you can go a bit lower with water loss. She might be a good matchup for Kyoka. Wasn't there a... mm -hmm. DJ? Please remind me. I'm also having like a Mandela moment. Wasn't there a a, an atom weight amateur fight at the beginning of this show, or am I? It wasn't atom weight. There was a fight at the beginning of the show, but I, there's no way it was atom weight. Those girls were way too big. There was a girl named Mana that fought. Oh, and Mana trying, and Eva or Eva or was that her? I'm trying to remember. I only remember it because one of the girls before the fight trained with Rin Nakai and actually wore a Rin Nakai shirt out to the fight. And was yeah. visibly crying next to me when Rinnekai won the tournament. That's all I remember. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, they were. There's no way they were atom weights. They were way too big. They were wearing huge gloves. So maybe that's why I'm confused. Sorry, Anouk. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. It. Oh, Anouk, were you saying something? I didn't mean to interrupt. It's the same. Like I think they were flyweights. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. So, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go the fights I want to see in the future. I'm going to include fighters who weren't even on this card. I want to see Miki Matano fight Hikaru Aono at Adam Waite. Yeah. Because Miki Matano and Hikaru Aono are both studs, and I need one of them in Rising, and in the winner of that fight should get into Rising. Because Miki Matano's two losses to Seika Izawa don't seem so bad now in hindsight. Um, I want to see Saudi Oshima... And I would like to see her against Aya Murakami defending her microweight belt against an even better Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, Aya Murakami, I believe, got her black belt faster than any female in Japanese history mm -hmm. in jiu-jitsu. And she has been submitting everybody. So I'd love to see that. And I don't really care about King Rena at this point. Um, Put her in something funny that'll make me laugh. Put her in like a weird mixed rules fight and I'll be all about it. Huh. Um, have her fight three, have her fight four microweights in a weird match I'm all about. Full and, Metal Dojo. Let's see. Get, this is never going to happen, but let's, let's say this is what I want. You get Kate Lotus to come back at straw weight and you get either Emmy Fujino over from Pancrase, or you get Karen from Pancrase, the champion, which is never going to happen. So Emmy Fujino and let her face another veteran who is a little bit older and see how she does. Cause it's also one of the few straw weights left with a respectable name. And those are the types of fights I would like to see, but mainly I want to see Miki Matono, Hikaru Aono, Saudi Oshima, 
And if, if, if they can get Seika Izawa on a deep show, I would watch her fight anybody. And, oh, okay, here's what we want. I want to see Seika Izawa fight Siwoo Park again. Ah, yes. Because people may forget, Siwoo Park kind of beat the crap out of Seika Izawa Ooh. on the feet. And she is the most explosive striker at Adam Weight in Japan. And she's probably, th- if not the, one of the most physically gifted Adam Weights in Japan. She is completely jacked and ripped. And Seika Izawa is not going to be able to muscle her around. And as a form, she trains at Crazy B now. And so her takedown defense has just gotten amazing working with Miyu Yamamoto. So I would like to see that rematch. Oh, sorry. One other match. You, you just reminded me. I want to see Yasuko, Yasuko Tamada versus Manhoof. Somewhere oh, down the line. Average age of over 100 going into the ring. Is this? Yes. Uh, who was the fight that they did that with? Was it Mark Coleman versus Randy Couture in the UFC where they were like, these guys combined age is over 100? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. By the way, when you were mentioning um, – how King Reyna has regressed. It reminded me of Dan Henderson. I'm not saying that Dan Henderson became a worse fighter. I just laughed because my friends started noticing that they would always talk about how good of a wrestler he was. And he would never go for a single takedown in any of his fights. It was just knocking everybody out. So Yeah. Yo Romero is the same way. In fact, yeah. actually, Yo Romero was actually wor- – he gets taken down in his fights. I mean, he gets right back up. But, like, for a guy who was an Olympic – who fought in who could be in the Olympics, like virtually never uses his wrestling in any of his matches ever. I want you to know that if you're in New York and you say the name Yo Romero, I hear Chris Weedman wakes up screaming. So oh, yes. <laughs> God, the UFC must hate him. We're gonna let you fight in your front of your home crowd in the most famous arena in the country, but you have to fight Yo Romero. <laughs> <laughs> The, the only worst matchmaking is when they had Gustafsson fight Anthony Johnson in his home country. Ugh, and, yeah, so. and when and when he lost, like the, the crowd didn't know how to react. It was kind of yeah, like, wasn't, uh, it like, wasn't it like four in the morning in their country? It was like, they're all been waiting yeah. for hours. Oh yeah. That, that, that also didn't help as well. It was like 4 a.m. But it was like, they were like, uh, uh, how do we react? I well, like, guess we got to go to a funeral tomorrow to bury uh, Gustafson. He just got murdered in the ring by Anthony Johnson. But yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, interesting. All right. So, Anouk, before we, and last thing, give us an update on the knee. When can we expect to see you back training? My knee, well, I just started jumping exercises. Ooh. I started like side exercises. And I think next up will be actually like the twisting, mm-hmm. which is kind of like the final stage. Um, but realistically speaking i think it will be another month or two until i get back to training and then until i get back to fighting will probably be around october ish but yeah i'm trying not to rush it because no i don't want to tear my acl again now that i don't want you to we don't want you to follow the dominant cruise career path so please take plenty of time to heal the leg andrew um your fellow 10th Planet guy, Tony Ferguson, I heard he cured his own ACL tear. Maybe he could give her some advice. Well, yeah. Well, also, the whole thing with the Dominic Cruz was that they kept putting in new AC. They were doing, like, the dead, dead, like, the cadaver, the cadaver ACL. The cadaver ACL, And he yeah. just kept on rejecting them. And then I think when he actually got one, he re-injured it somehow. I think that's what happened. Because remember, didn't he, he get from- one, and then he injured the other one. And then, yes, yeah. yeah, so my friends and I used to joke that Dominic Cruz is tendons were made of fiberglass but oh i think i think they were i remember i remember it was so long i remember when Hunter morale was like interim champion for so long and usc just said fuck it we'll just make him the champion just like out of the blue one day like oh he's actually not interim champion anymore he is now officially champion of uh bantamweight they still maintain that dominic cruz's performance against mizugaki is the most perfect performance i've ever seen in a fight <laughs> Oh, for a return fight, absolutely. That's the that's how somebody should always be when they when they come back after a three year layoff of getting their ACLs ripped apart. As a JMMA fan, I was like, oh, I just saw Mizugaki get murdered in the ring. Like that, that was like a snuff film. That was the most violent 
first round I've ever seen. So yeah. Oh, it was beautiful. Interesting. All right. Well, where can let's uh, wrap this up. Andrew Benjamin, plug your stuff. Where can people get a hold of you? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm one half of the We Are Rising podcast with Jay Christian Guy from Focus Fights. You can uh, see our stuff on YouTube. I'll eventually stop, start uploading the audio versions to stuff on SoundCloud uh, slash Spotify slash Stitcher when I am not feeling lazy and having to work around uh, audacity. Um, and uh, Oh, and I also write for MMASucker.com, which you can uh, uh, see stuff usually rise in sometimes Bellator stuff I mostly cover, uh, but we cover everything from your grappling, jujitsu, whatever, combat stuff to, you know, 1FC to whatever. So, yeah, that's come to MMA Soccer for all, all of our good stuff. And, yes, we are Rising Pod is the Twitter handle, I think. All right, so attention versus Takedo. Pick one. Just give me a name. Oh, fuck. I mean... I'm still hesitant that this fight's actually happening until I actually see it happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to, right now, I have to still, I have to be on the side of, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Gun to my head, tension. All right. All right. Anouk, plug your stuff and then tell me, tension of Takeda. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. You can find me on Twitter at, I think, at Anna Wilson. But I'm actually not on Twitter so much. So I'm more on Instagram where I'm findable as P-H-A-I-A-F-O-X, Firefox. Um, yeah. By the way, I'm an amateur deep fighter for those who didn't know. Um, and I will go for tension because I have not seen a single fight of the other guy. <laughs> Okay. okay. Oh revealing, god. revealing your youth. Oh my god! Revealing your youth. Revealing your youth. Yes. I would highly recommend you go on YouTube because K1 has it up and watch Takeru's fight with Koji. Oh. And feel really good for yourself. Feel really good. But um, interesting. So I have to ask: Is your username is it a homage to the browser Firefox? Oh, that it's it's kind of a long story. It was kind of like Fire as in P H A I. A, it's kind of a green mm -hmm. that I used to play in this kind of like very old fashioned video game called Juice, which I used to play and I used to pick that name. And then my favorite animal is a fox. And yeah. since the name Fire was already taken, I was just like, oh, let's just add fox to that. And then I realized it sounded like Firefox, which is like the browser. So that made it even more interesting. I've been using that as my online name ever since. There we go. There we go. And I'm going to go against you guys. I am Taketu through and through. Um, I love that he finally responded. Speaking of training in the U.S., I love that he finally responded to the video of T.J. Dillashaw cheap shotting him in training, to saying oh, that he did that because he knocked him down a bunch of times in training, and T.J. was upset about it. I'm what a fucking dick, T.J. Like I saw that video. What a fucking yeah. I I, I was about to use a really bad word. A really 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 bad. <laughs> Does word. it rhyme with punt? A rhyme? Yes. <laughs> also, I, I, I should not use the present woman, but like, seriously, like, it's like, how, why do you fucking do that? That's what, 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 what's he fucking trying to prove? Like, okay, let's assume that even if he wasn't knocked down it, while fighting or sparring, like, what's the impetus for doing that? Like, like, what does it do? Like, well, what also, the, like, what's it do? I'm just like trying to think, like, what, like, what is, like, what are you trying to prove or get across by it's doing that? It's upsetting to me because I was there when he beat Hen and Brow both times. And so TJ Dillashaw at one point in time was legitimately one of the best fighters on the planet. And it's unfortunate that he was such a dirty fighter in training. Because wasn't there also that was it Chris Holmesworth? Is that the guy's name? Yeah, uh, yeah, Holmesworth. Yeah, and Chris there's Holmesworth. all these other stories. I heard apparently he was a dick. Uh, he was like the the jock jock douchebag type that was like in college when he was wrestling and all that stuff. And it's like, why you gotta be like this? Why you gotta be like this? Um, well, I feel uh, like it's another, important to add. Jamie just mentioned that Takeda's gym is famous for that as well, so it probably made him feel at home to have a fighter cheap shot him in training. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, here's, you know, I'm not going to deny what Jamie's saying, but I at least have video evidence for what, uh, what, what, uh, what Dillashaw did. Listen, it probably happens in, in the K1 Osaka, whatever the fuck it's called. 
<laughs> the home reversal gym. But like, until I see video of it, I'm not I'm not gonna put any any sort of um, any any uh, scarlet letter on a taco room until oh. I see until I see video of it. Why would TJ Dillashaw get upset that one of the best kickboxers in the world dropped him in kickboxing sparring? It's like, are you even sure that TJ Dillashaw knew who he even was? Uh, that's a good point. How do you not well, know? That's not his own talk room, but like the the a lot of. Yes, you know, I feel, like I, I, I feel like I said, "How do you not know who Tuck Pedo is?" And Anuk didn't know who he was. hasn't seen any of his fights. So well, maybe I'm well, an old man. It's because well, I'll tell you this: a lot of people, a lot of MMA fighters, are not like Spike Carlisle, who are just who are MMA nerds or kickboxing yeah. nerds, you know, or you know that you know. Oh, listen, now kickboxing. that you say that, you you've you made a mistake because TJ's Dillashaw's coach is a massive MMA kickboxing nerd. There is no okay. way that, okay. what was, uh, what's his name? Dwayne Ludwig. Well, Dwayne, Dwayne Ludwig, Ludwig right? is obsessed with Japanese MMA. Okay, yes. So. I, Ludwig is. But TJ, I have no doubt he doesn't even know. He has no inkling of like what goes on outside. Um, I would love to say Team Alpha Male, but um, whatever the fuck uh, they call their gym. The, are are you saying the... Uh, HGH is blocking his brain from all the steroids he was doing. Oh yeah, that that too as well with his, with his weird ass nipples. You've ever seen the photos of his of, of like? Um, no, I can't say I have. <laughs> Gladly, he has the, he has that the the, the the testosterone that the HGH nipples that okay. like deform them. Mm. It's really gross. Well, I'll also, I mean, one of Conor McGregor's greatest moments is when he predicted everything TJ Dillashaw was about to do. Uh, the ultimate fighter and he kept calling him a snake in front of uh uriah favor so i don't know how this became the make fun of tj dillashaw moment but i feel like you and i could ramble about a lot of things but yeah so that was our uh roundup of deep jewels 37 and we will be doing this for other deep and deep jewels events as well and um if anuka is available we'll have her back on i know she's a busy lady and maybe next time We'll get Andrew or we'll get his other better half Christian on to see what he has to say about the fights. But until yeah, then. Oh, I was about to say, listen, please get me on for the next deep, deep amateur Osaka show <laughs> with whoever versus Thomas or whatever that fight that just happened was. Oh, I'm telling you, the next <laughs> you, joke, you joke, I know you want to come on here and talk about who is Shuto Watanabe fighting again? Is he, is he fighting? Oh, wait. Not is Daisuke Nakamura is fighting the Rock guy, right? Yeah, he's fighting Yuta and the Rock. Yuta he's... star emoji Rock, right? Oh no, no, it's it's ampersand. It's ampersand. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, so Yuta go. and the Rock. So this, so he went from a ta- from from two on two tag team to now one versus two. I know it's one person that goes that like I just oh, one of those one of those. Oh, it's Shuto is um. Fuck, who the fuck is Shooter fighting again? Um, Shooter Watanabe is fighting someone fun, isn't he? I forget. Um, I'd go to Topology, but they seem to hate Japanese MMA recently. Is it uh, regards, that, 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 deep, that deep car looks actually amazing. It's got Kitawoka also as well. Yue Sako representing yeah, his yeah. new gym. Um, that guy from AACC is fighting some guy in the main event. Oh, my God, I'm having a... But yeah, that card's who is Shuto Watanabe fighting? I should know this. My weird uh, what, obsession it, um, with Shuto Watanabe. Was it show? No, 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 no. Um Tarker? Was it Tarker? That's exactly who it is. That's exactly who it is. You sir are correct. All right, cool. Well, as we go off on another tangent, thanks everyone for coming in, and we'll be doing this again. Until then, yeah. have a great day.